Greetings and welcome, one and all, to Beyond the Walls. Wherever you are in this moment, in hundreds of different locations spread across the world, I thank you for gathering together to form an intentional sacred community. And I want to take the opportunity to welcome the many newcomers present in our gathering. On YouTube alone in the past month, people have spent more than 200,000 hours, if you can imagine that figure, 200,000 hours watching our Center Place videos. And many of you have been watching, or in some cases binge watching, the recordings of our Tuesday evening history, theology, and philosophy lectures. From that introduction, many have wondered, what does an inclusive church look and feel like? If a group rejects dogma, historicity, literalism, and along with that, the narrow provincialism of policing outdated social norms grounded in a single privileged culture, and instead embraces thoughtful inquiry into truth wherever it is found, how does that work as a church? Hopefully, we can strive to model those ideals today and every day, knowing that what we do know, I'm sorry, what we don't know, that should say, is far greater than what we do. So, what we don't know is far greater than what we do. And knowing that as humans, we have made errors, like the one in the last slide, and we're making errors now, even as we strive to continually learn and grow in our discipleship. Our theme today, Where You Go, I Will Go, is a quotation from the Book of Ruth. The protagonist, uh, is a quotation from Ruth, who is the protagonist in the Book of Ruth in the Hebrew Bible. This is one of my favorite books in the whole Bible. A lot of people read the Bible or misread the Bible as if it is spoken with a single voice. And if you grew up reading it in King James English, it gives off that impression since the language has become alien to us. But we understand that Scripture speaks in many voices, that the Bible is a collection of texts written by different authors in different times and contexts with different human limitations and biases. The Book of Ruth is an excellent example. The anonymous prophet or prophetess, priest or scribe who wrote the text in the Second Temple period and was perhaps a contemporary of Ezra, the author of the book of Ezra. Ezra was a Jewish priest and an official of the Persian Empire. Uh, when the Judean nobles returned from their exile in Babylon and built the second temple in Jerusalem, which was then under Persian rule. The Israelites who'd remained in Judea were overjoyed at the restoration of the temple. But Ezra took a very hard line on Jewish law. His in his interpretation, only ethnically pure Israelites were welcome in his assembly. He quoted the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse 2, no half-breed may be admitted to the assembly of Yahweh, not even his descendants to the tenth generation may be admitted to the assembly of Yahweh. Well, most of the people who had remained in the Holy Land had not been following this rule. They were now part of a large multi-ethnic empire, and they had begun to intermarry with their neighbors, including Israel's old enemy, the Moabites. We are told in the book of Ezra, chapter 10, verse 44, that as a result of Ezra's demands for purity, Judean men divorced their foreign wives and abandoned their children. The author of the book of Ruth must have viewed Ezra's literalistic interpretation of the law as a source of suffering and injustice. Ruth fortunately tells a very different story. Prefiguring Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, we have here the story of the Good Moabite. Despite her ethnic status as Israel's enemy, Ruth is a model of a loyal daughter-in-law to Naomi. Where you go, I will go, she declares. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. 
And spoiler alert to the story, at the end of the story when Ruth marries a Judean named Boaz, their union produces a son named Obed, a, a mixed race or myth ethnicity son, Israelite and Moabite. Oeb's son is named Jesse, and Jesse's son is named David. And that David is the same shepherd boy who became Israel, Israel's beloved king. The author here is saying, if we follow Ezra's interpretation of law, David himself would have been excluded from the congregation. And so scripture speaks with many voices. And sometimes these voices are at odds with each other. We invite the Spirit to be with us in discernment so that the ancient words of Scripture can be revelatory in our lives today. May we emulate the example of the author of Ruth today as we build a congregation where none are excluded. All are welcome in this inclusive church. And let us begin our worship today by going live to Tempe, Arizona, where Pat Marmoy will read our call to worship. Pat, welcome back to Beyond the Walls. Thank you, John. Our call to worship is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And meet, uh, as he went a little farther, he met James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Amen. Amen. And now I invite you to join with the Beyond the Walls Choir in singing our rousing opening hymn number 404, Canticle of the Turning. My soul cries out with a joyful shout that the God of my heart is great. And my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the ones who wait. You fixed your sight on your servant's plight, and my weakness you did not spurn. So from east to west shall my name be blessed, with the world be about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Though I am small, my God, my all, you work great things in me. And your mercy will last from the depths of the past to the end of the age to be. Your very name puts the proud to shame, and to those who would for you yearn. You will show your might, put the strong to fight, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Which holds us bound till the spear and rod can. 
be crushed by God who is turning the world around. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near and the world is about to turn. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone who shares their voice with the choir each week. And in that rendition, I want to thank Sandy Gamay for playing the flute. It was beautiful. And now we go live to Mount Pleasant, Michigan, where Noel Gafka will offer our invocation. Noel, we're so happy to have you back on Beyond the Walls. It's amazing to be back. Thank you. The beautiful thing about praying is that we have many different ways to communicate with and to pray to God. Today, we will invite God to be present through our words and with our bodies. It is important to acknowledge that prayer can be an uncomfortable practice. This means if we feel uncomfortable during our times of movement, we're doing something right. <laughs> Our movements today will be gentle and safe for all bodies, and we will not even need to leave our chairs. I will start by praying with words only, and then we'll invite you to join me in prayer with our bodies. Let us pray together. O oh God, who continually calls us into diverse communities far and wide, we invite you to open our ears to hear your call. O oh God, who yearns to unite the spaces in between us, we invite you to open our minds to the possibilities of being truly connected, regardless of our physical location today. And oh God, who celebrates with us as we focus and center ourselves on you, we invite you to ignite our hearts, to sing, to laugh, to explore, to question, to experience wholeness, and to move with you. Oh God, as we continue to pray with our bodies, move with us. Join me now as we pray with our hands inviting the Holy Spirit to open our ears. We now invite the Spirit to envelop us as we pray to unite the spaces between us. And lastly, we pray that God will ignite our hearts as we pray, where you go, I will go.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Noel. And now we go to Erlinger, Kentucky, where Neil Deatley will teach our peace lesson. Neil, thank you for being with us up beyond the walls. Thank you, John. What does it mean to be a nation? How do you understand yourself in relation to your country? Do these perceptions influence how you consider others from differing backgrounds? How do these factors determine your understanding of what constitutes one's neighbor? These questions are certainly not new. In fact, they lie at the heart of today's lectionary reading. According to the Hebrew Bible, a great famine causes Naomi, her husband Elimelech, and their two sons to leave their native Bethlehem for the land of Moab. There the sons marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Within a 10 year period, all the men in this story die, leaving Naomi and her daughter-in-laws completely on their own with little means of income, safety, or future. Considering the despondency of their situation, Naomi urges the women to return to their homes. After at first refusing, Orpah leaves, but Ruth resists and accompanies her mother-in-law back to Judah. Where you go, I will go. These familiar words are a declaration of countercultural commitments amidst the uncertainty of death, devastation, and displacement. With these words, Ruth affirms her dedication to Naomi as she seeks a future of hope in a new and unfamiliar land. I invite us all to reflect and consider where we encounter Naomi's and Ruth's in our contemporary contexts. In our nations and communities, where do we find the poor, displaced, mistreated, and diseased? Where do we see the countless individuals and communities experiencing conditions that diminish their ability to make choices? As believers, we are prophetically called to open our ears to the pleadings of people in all nations who, like Ruth and Naomi, desperately seek a future of hope. How will we respond? The 20th century Swiss theologian Karl Barth, as a political exile, was forced to leave Germany in 1935 for refusing to sign an oath of loyalty to Adolf Hitler. Writing his highly influential and expansive work, Church Dogmatics, amidst turmoil and violence in Europe, Bart struggled with the question of insiders and outsiders, neighbors and strangers. Considering motifs of near and distant neighbors, Bart wrote, one's own people in its location cannot and must not be a wall, but a door, whether it be widely opened or not, and even perhaps shut again, it must never be barred, let alone locked up. In the realm of God, there is no other side for we are all interconnected. The God of peace views all people as having an estimable and equal worth. God desires complete wholeness, reconciliation, 
and healing for all creation. The call of the faithful is to seek broader visions, to challenge unjust systems that diminish human worth and become a sanctuary of peace where people from all nations can be gathered as neighbors without dividing walls. Endless possibilities await those willing to see with new eyes. What does it mean to be a nation? How do you understand yourself in relation to your country? How do these factors determine your understanding of what constitutes one's neighbor? These questions do not have easy answers, but we cannot consider them without discerning what it means to be God's people, called to pursue peace amid the nations of the world. This mission does not come without uncertainty and perhaps at times even fear. And yet we have the promise of the spirit to be with us as we seek to build life-giving communities that act as a web, a connecting network of life, both within us and between us. Through this, the God of peace will be glorified. Through this, we will truly learn what it means to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors, both near and far, as ourselves. Amen. Thank you so much, Neil. And I want to thank each one of you for coming together as a global congregation, a global congregation beyond the walls. Two weeks ago, I shared with you some of the needs of our Beyond the Walls choir ministry. For the past two years, we have endeavored to keep the church singing by bringing voices together, voices of members and friends from around the world, providing professional recordings for this service, and then making those recordings available for everyone. So producing a hymn is an enormous undertaking. Uh, we carefully select the hymns to support the scripture and the theme of the service. We consider copyright and request permission and licenses where needed. Mike typesets the sheet music and sometimes he makes a new arrangement of the hymn so that it can be sung in four parts. Mike also records the piano or the organ track. Then I sing all four parts and create videos that our singers use to learn their part and record their voice. Each hymn requires four or five reference files. In addition to that, we have weekly rehearsals now on Zoom. Every singer must learn their part, record their voice, make sure the recording is good, and ultimately send the file to us. Every week, up to 100 voice recordings must be sorted, combined, cleaned up, synchronized. All the voices are mixed with the instruments and then that audio combined um, is combined with an original video track, like the one we just saw sometimes, or just the, the sheet music sometimes, to produce the, sh the hymn for the service. Every hymn is different, but on average, if you consider the work of everyone involved, it requires roughly 100 human hours to produce a hymn. If we multiply 100 hours by the 138 hymns that we recorded, we can quickly see that the overall time expenditure has been substantial. Two weeks ago, we asked for your help in continuing and expanding this ministry. And we set a fundraising goal of $25,000. Today, I want to thank every one of you who have responded for your generosity. 
We have received an amazing outpouring of generosity from mission centers and congregations who use our music in your services and events. So many individuals who have felt inspired by this ministry have also responded. It has been deeply heartening for me, for all of us, for all our singers, to learn how much this work has been enjoyed and appreciated. So from the support we received in these first two weeks, we are already at 20% of the way to our goal. If you have not yet responded, and if this resource and this ministry is something that has been meaningful to you or your congregation or your mission center, we invite you to consider whether it is within your means to help us reach our goal. As always, we want to thank everyone who contributes in every way you contribute. And thank you, of course, for coming together today once again as the Congregation Beyond the Walls. Gracias por venir hoy a conformar esta congregación más allá de las paredes. Merci d'être venu aujourd'hui en tant que la congregación au-delà des murs. And as always, I thank you when you come here on Facebook and you give us a like, and especially, or on YouTube, and especially when you share the video, because that way you're inviting someone to Christ. That is ministry. You can do ministry just with a click, just with a share. Hello, Barbara. Hi, Mimi from Topeka. Hi, Topeka. For that ministry, I want to thank you. Por ese ministerio, como siempre, te doy las gracias. Por ese ministerio, como toujours. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Leandro. Thank you, Mike. And thank everyone who has responded so generously. And now we're very excited to go live to Tahiti, where Amanda Vanaa is here to read our lectionary. Amanda, welcome it's back to Beyond the Walls. Bonjour, John. Merci. Notre lecture d'aujourd'hui porte sur les 18 premiers versets du livre de Ruth. Du temps des juges, il y eut une famine dans le pays. Un homme de Bethléem, de Juda, parti, avec sa femme et ses deux fils pour faire un séjour dans le pays de Moab. Le nom de cet homme était Elimelech, celui de sa femme, Naomi, et ses deux fils s'appelaient Maclon et Kijon. Ils étaient Ephraciens, de Bethléem, de Juda. Arrivés au pays de Moab, ils y fixèrent leur demeure. Elimelech, mari de Naomi, mourut et elle resta avec ses deux fils. Ils prirent des femmes moabites, dont l'une se nommait Orpha et l'autre Ruth, et ils habitaient là environ dix ans. Maclon et Kijon moururent aussi tous les deux, et Naomi resta privée de ses deux fils et de son mari. Puis elle se leva, elle et ses belles-filles, afin de quitter le pays de Moab, car elle apprit au pays de Moab que l'Éternel avait visité son peuple et lui avait donné du pain. Elle sortit du lieu qu'elle habitait, accompagnée de ses deux belles-filles, et elle se mit en route pour retourner dans le pays de Juda. Naomi dit alors à ses deux belles-filles, « Allez, retournez chacune à la maison de sa mère. Que l'Éternel use de bonté envers vous, comme vous l'avez fait envers ceux qui sont morts et envers moi. Que l'Éternel 
vous fasse trouver à chacune du repos dans la maison d'un mari. Et elle les baisa. Elles élevèrent la voix et pleurèrent. Et elles lui dirent, « Non, nous irons, nous irons avec toi vers ton peuple. » Naomi dit, « Retournez, mes filles. Pourquoi viendrez-vous avec moi? Ai-je encore dans mon sein des fils qui puissent devenir vos maris? Retournez, mes filles. Allez, je suis trop vieille pour me remarier. Et quand je dirai, j'ai de l'espérance, qu'en cette nuit même je serai avec un mari et que j'enfanterai des fils, attendriez-vous pour cela qu'ils eussent grandi? Refuseriez-vous pour cela de vous marier? Non, mes filles, car à cause de vous, je suis dans une grande affliction de ce que la main de l'Éternel s'est étendue contre moi. Et elles élevèrent la voix et pleurèrent encore. Orpa baisa sa mère, mais Ruth s'attacha à elle. Naomi dit à Ruth, « Voici ta belle-sœur est retournée vers son peuple et vers ses dieux. Retourne comme ta belle-sœur. » Ruth répondit, « Ne me presse pas de te laisser, de retourner loin de toi. Où tu iras, j'irai. Où tu demeureras, je demeurerai. Ton peuple sera mon peuple et ton Dieu sera mon Dieu. Où tu mourras, je mourrai. Et j'y serai enterré. Que l'Éternel me traite dans toute sa rigueur, si autre chose que la mort vient à me séparer de toi. Naomi, la voyant décider à aller avec elle, c'est ça ses, ses instances. Amen. Thank you, Amanda. And now we go live to Edina, Minnesota where Dan Gregory is here to preach our sermon. Dan, thank you so much for sharing your ministry with Beyond the Walls. Thank you, John. It's good to be with all of you today. Have you ever felt that you were completely alone? Has it ever seemed like the world was just stacked against you? Has all of your hard work and strong efforts just collapsed in front of you and left you staring at the broken pieces? Sometimes the circumstances of life can leave us feeling really alone and overwhelmed. Sometimes even the little joys slip away and the little bit of stability that we had disappears. Life can be really hard sometimes, right? We've been talking about suffering for the last few weeks in worship, about how suffering is not God's will and how we're supposed to protest the unnecessary suffering that we experience and find in the world. With Job, we've cried out in anguish as everything slips away and we're left without any good reason why. Job was confronted with the question, what do you do when you lose everything? In today's text, we have a different set of characters and a different storyline, but the same basic question. How do we respond when we feel completely alone in a world stacked against us? Our story opens in a town with a very familiar name, Bethlehem. In Hebrew, the name Bethlehem roughly translates as house of bread, and it sits in a very fertile area. But there's a problem in our story. Even in this land of plenty, there is a famine. There's no food to eat, and the situation is getting bad. So a woman named Naomi packs up the few things she owns and leaves town with her husband and two sons. They end up moving across the border into the land of Moab, one of Israel's worst enemies. But Naomi and her family are able to create a new life there, with her sons each marrying Moabite women and all of them able to eat, thanks to the work that the men could find. Just when it felt like things were looking up though, her husband and sons died. Her world, the one steady part of her life was ripped away from her. She didn't just lose the people that she loved the most in the world. When her husband and sons died, she lost her standing in the world. In her day, society believed a woman only had value 
as a wife or a mother. When our cultures and societies are based around ideas of power, who you are and what you have matters a lot. In Naomi's day, being a childless widow meant you had no power and therefore you didn't matter. As an immigrant, Naomi was suspect to her new neighbors who had probably kept a healthy distance from even getting to know her. As an older woman, her culture decided she couldn't produce anything. She couldn't farm, she couldn't fight, she couldn't have children, so she was useless. Who cared if she lived or died? Is it really that different in our day and society? Have you ever felt tossed aside or overlooked? Have you ever felt like no one cared what happened to you? When suffering hits us, when our sense of meaning is taken away, when society says we're expendable, it can take us to some pretty dark places. It can feel like we don't have a direction. Like Naomi, we are confronted by the question, what do you do when you feel completely alone in a world stacked against you? Because let's be honest, Naomi was in a bad situation. She had left her hometown as a climate refugee, fleeing to another country, an enemy country, no less, just on the hopes of finding enough food to survive. Now she found herself without a husband in a male-dominated society, without sons to look after her in her old age, without any of the support or protection the culture of her day demanded for her to live with any sense of stability. She was a stranger in a strange land. She knew the chances of survival were slim at best, and it was more likely that she would die along the road back to Bethlehem than to be safe and stable in life again. So she turns to her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, and is really honest with them. They're both mourning the death of their husbands too. Naomi tells them they should go back to Moab, back to a family and a community that can support them. Maybe they're still young enough to maybe find new husbands. There's no such hope for her, Naomi says, but she doesn't want Ruth and Orpah to suffer the same fate. She offers them blessings and wishes them well, hopeful that they can find what she cannot. In an incredible profession of love, Orpah and Ruth insist on staying with Naomi. They take a step toward her and declare that they'll return with her to her people. You can hear the care and the compassion in their hearts. There's a tenderness in this scene of three women confronting the ugly, ugly realities of their society together. But Naomi insists that she knows what's best. And she tells them once more to go back to their homes. When we experience grief and bitterness and loss, it can often feel like we're protecting others from that suffering is the natural, responsible thing to do. We presume that carrying our pain alone is what's best. We want to shield the people who care about us from having to enter the depths with us, from having to step into the unknown with us. So we push them away for their own good, we tell ourselves. Tearfully, Orpah kisses her mother-in-law and heads back to Moab. Now, Orpah did nothing wrong. She saw the pain and loneliness and difficulty Naomi faced, and she wanted to alleviate it. She wanted to help make it better. And when Naomi made a logical, compelling argument for why it was in Orpah's best interest to leave, she still found it hard to step away and say goodbye. But Ruth, Ruth insists, do not press me to leave you, she pleads, or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. It's beautifully poetic and powerful, but it's also incredibly stark and realistic. 
Ruth isn't dismissing Naomi's concerns. She doesn't pretend that everything will be easy and will just work out great. In fact, she is very clear about the challenges ahead, but she makes Naomi's concerns her own. She doesn't try to fix things, but instead reminds Naomi she won't have to face them alone. If you want a handbook on how to practice the ministry of presence, start here. And in this moment of care and vulnerability, Naomi has a choice to make. Will she continue to insist that she move forward alone? Or, or will she let Ruth come close to her pain and her struggle and her suffering? When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Naomi effectively says, okay, you can come along. She cracks open the door to something new. There's no magic happy switch that gets flipped. There's not even a real resolution to the tension, to the challenges that they face. Things don't get better all at once. But in this moment, something shifts. And neither Naomi or Ruth will be the same because of it. See, we like to envision ourselves as the Ruths in this story, sacrificially setting aside our own concerns to take care of someone who needs us. And there are times when we need to be ready to love and minister in this way. But I think the text has a subtle way of asking us to see ourselves more as Naomi, it asks us to see the strength in vulnerability and the bravery of letting someone else in. It asks us to follow Naomi's example by putting ourselves in a position to be loved and seen by someone else. Naomi isn't someone weak to be pitied. She is someone strong enough to face the challenges of the world and wise enough to let someone else step forward with her. Naomi allows Ruth to walk alongside her. She lets Ruth into her world. She lets the mask down and lets herself be seen. In a harsh world stacked against her, Naomi allows herself to be cared for, allows someone else to stand in solidarity with her. It was the decisions of these two women that made the unfolding future possible. It is in their linking of arms and lives, their joining together in recognition of their mutual well being, that they found hope. This isn't a story about one person relying on the other for aid, it's a story about two people depending on one another as friends along the way. When we are faced with the dark moments of our lives, one of the bravest things we can do is let someone else draw alongside us and then step into the future with us. When it seems like all else is lost, we are reminded there's strength to be found in relationships of care and concern. When we experience suffering, we don't need answers to why, we need friends. We need companionship. We need someone else to remind us we aren't alone. If you're tired or hurting or feel alone, ask yourself, who do I trust to be my real self around? Who is someone in my life that I can open up to about my fears and struggles? Who is the root? in your life today. The person offering you their hand and asking to share the journey with you. The person saying, where you go, I will go. Like Naomi, we each have a chance to respond. Will you choose to walk the road alone? Or will you take a chance and be vulnerable and let someone else care about you? When we choose to walk with one another, New possibilities open up. Naomi and Ruth's decision to face the world together 
ends up making a world of difference, not just for the two of them, but for many others. Ruth the Moabite, Ruth from the hated foreign enemy of Israel, Ruth who subverted social expectations by rejecting the path society had laid out for her. This Ruth ends up being an ancestor to the greatest king Israel will ever know in David and an ancestor to the greatest hope the world will ever know in Jesus. Bethlehem, the house of bread, which Naomi had fled due to a famine, will one day be known as the birthplace of the bread of life because of her return. Maybe the ripple effect of our choice to be vulnerable and let others walk with us won't be as grand or as cosmic. Allowing someone else to draw close to our pain, letting them walk with us through it still makes a difference. We can find healing and hope. We can practice the sacred rhythm of sharing each other's burdens. And as we learn to name the pain and suffering and fear in our lives and the world, we can form bonds of love and solidarity across race, religion, nationality, class, sexual orientation, gender identity, and perspective. As followers of Christ, we know there are days we are more like Naomi and days we are more like Ruth. In sacred community, we can be both. We can be fully human with all the ups and the downs that come with us and trust that no matter what, we'll walk together. Because the center of our community, Jesus the Christ, has showed us how. Jesus showed us how to be vulnerable and he showed us how to support others. It's a beautiful thing to know that Jesus counts as his ancestors, the two strong women whose story we heard today. In their story, Ruth and Naomi point to the nature of God as both one who suffers and one who comes to be with. The good news of the gospel, dear friends, is that God goes into the unknown with us and makes the plight of the dismissed and disadvantaged God's own. God extends a hand to every weary and hurting traveler and says, where you go, I will go. This is justice in action. Naming the cause of our suffering letting others encounter it with us and moving forward as equals in search of a better future. How do we respond when we feel completely alone in a world stacked against us? We risk vulnerability, connect with community and allow someone else to walk with us. This can be good news indeed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dan. And now let us slow down for a moment. Let us take a deep breath. I invite you to join me in a brief meditative journey. Just breathe. And where do we go? When we set aside a moment to meditate, we are fully led by the Spirit. Relax and breathe. We surrender to the mysterious leading power of the Spirit when we deliberately set everything aside and just follow our breath. 
breathe, follow your breath, relax. Breathing in, let the spirit reach every cell within your body. Breathing out, set yourself free of worries and concerns. Even for just another moment, you will always have time to worry. The Spirit now invites you to let go of that habit, just for this moment, the present moment. Breathing in, let the Spirit enter all the rooms within your mind where there is worry, fear, pain, doubt, regret, guilt. Breathing out, let the Spirit take all those concerns away and be still. And now allow the Spirit to lead you in this inner journey. Breathe gently, slowly, deeply, soothing breath, relax, be present. The Spirit might lead you down unexpected or difficult paths. The path might be hard to find sometimes. You might find yourself going astray, led by thoughts, feelings, physical sensations, but the Spirit is always waiting for you in the next breath you take. So breathe, relax, be right here, right now. And when the path becomes too difficult and the burden you carry too heavy, remember Naomi. Naomi felt unwanted, unworthy. She wanted to be alone. She pushed people away. Where you go, I will go. As Dan said, God goes into the unknown with us. Breathe in and breathe out and hear the voice in the sheer silence that says, Fear not. Be still. Where you go, I will go. May we find the courage to walk the path of the spirits this week. May we hear the eternal voice of the one that tenderly whispers. Where you go, I will go. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Leandro. I want to thank everyone who makes this ministry possible each week to our technology team, Mary Jean Belrose, Lee Mitchell, Troy Roach, to our translation team, Sandra Rodriguez, Kahelani, Faaturai, Drole, and of course, Leandro. 
to our phone ministry team, Roger Dodson, Bill Mines, Vicki Thatcher, the hosts of our Zoom gatherings, Evan Charlie, Vicki Thatcher, Neil DeAtley, Bill Mines. Thanks to Leandro for everything that he does, our video director of the choir, and so much more. To Jerry Dale Jr. and Sean Matheson, who serve as producers of this service. Again, to Roger, who serves as the chaplain for our minister's meeting. And of course, to Michael Karpowitz for his amazing ministry of music and working as our audio director. I want to invite you to experience Beyond the Walls programming throughout the week. In preparation for next Sunday's theme of the living restoration, we are spending this week exploring our different understandings of restoration heritage and distinctives. So join us Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern for an all new and live lecture on Joseph Smith Jr. entitled Joseph the Seer, Reflections and Reevaluations. We will look at Joseph Smith's early religious beliefs and his background as a treasure seer and how both informed his later experiences as a religious seer and prophet, the composition of the Book of Mormon, and the organization of the church. On Thursday at 7.30 Eastern, join with the Beyond the Walls Choir as they begin to learn the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah. Later that evening at 9 p.m., join us for Social Hour. Social Hour has gotten really good, folks. If you haven't been here in a while, join it. In the Restoration Room, Evan Charlie will facilitate a discussion about Community of Christ as a big tent embodying our principle of unity and diversity. In the Lectionary Room, Neil DeAtley will lead a discussion on Doctrine and Covenants 162 2E, Breathe New Life. Or share a spiritual practice in the Relaxation Room with Vicki Thatcher. Finally, join us next Sunday on the Beyond the Walls for the Living Restoration. A service will uh, have Robin Linkhart uh, give our, our message. And now, as we conclude, I invite you to join again with the Beyond the Walls Choir in singing our closing hymn, number 637, Lord Who Views All People Precious. thank the choir once again. Uh, it's amazing ministry that you're performing each week. Go forth today with the conclusion of the book of Ruth as found in the fourth chapter. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. 
When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not le left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They called him Obed, and he became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Amen. I invite you to stay with us after the postlude as we chat with the ministers. Thanks, everyone. John. Thank you. My goodness. Thanks to everyone for such an amazing service. Um, I think I, I'm very happy with how uh, we've treated, like I say, my, probably my favorite book in the Old Testament. <laughs> and I felt like uh, the interlacing of this story and drawing on it from the different uh, perspectives and how um, often is the case, even if we're uh, across all of these different locations and even continents, um, uh, how even without a lot of, we're, we're not working together necessarily, and yet it, the way it all comes together can be so miraculous. Um, you know, for example, Noel, uh, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, and I, your, your reminder to us that prayer can be uncomfortable and also your encouragement for, of us to uh, step outside our comfort zone in the practice you shared with us this morning. Absolutely, I think in our humanness, we are also centered on feeling comfortable and being perfect and fitting that mold all the time that when we get to experience something a little different or unique, we all freeze up and go, this is not okay. <laughs> <laughs> I should not be, it's fight or flight. <laughs> and it even happens during our times of worship and, and times of being together. Our, our humanness kicks in and we go, I don't know, should I be doing this? Am I going to look weird to somebody else? What if I don't move the way that somebody else moves? And then we have to pause and say, we are so beautifully diverse and so beautifully unique. We're not going to move like anybody else does because we are not that person. And so to be able to pray in such a way that that we can experience that movement is profound. I once was in a situation 
And this may not be a surprise where, where I was leading a movement prayer and I knocked over something in the <laughs> middle of that prayer because I was so in tuned with what was going on and my arms were so big. And I paused for a moment and my humanness kicked in and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in the front of, of these people and I just knocked this thing over and, and they're going to expect to have to knock over something as well. But they didn't, thank goodness. <laughs> and instead we em embrace the sense that we're unique and things happen. <laughs> Absolutely. I tend to be a, a speaker, a lecturer with my hands too. And so I have had mm -hmm. that problem. And in fact, actually more than once that very issue of <laughs> knocking things over <laughs> in the middle of it. Although I'm glad the people who were following along your example didn't feel compelled. They had the discernment not to feel that they had to then also crash something. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> well, I thank you for challenging us that way. One of the things about stepping out, our com out of our um, comfort zone is we, we are also um, continually inviting people to join us in community. And, mm -hmm. and, when, and when we are only doing things by rote the way we've always done them, we forget why we do them. And we ha and it makes us have trouble explaining to newcomers what we're doing or why we value this or what this is for. And so it's when we step outside of it and look at it from ourselves from a little bit different perspective that we actually remember the value and also are able to share that. Absolutely. If you look at our scriptures, it's filled with a lot of people being uncomfortable. <laughs> this just <laughs> happened. What do we do with it? <laughs> so we are just living that out today. <laughs> well, thank you so much again. Thank you. Amanda, I am so happy that you're able to be with us. Um, we just had a few weeks ago our testimony service from Tahiti. All voices testifying against uh, across uh, French Polynesia, and you were so helpful in making that possible. It was a lot of work to bring that together, and so I'm happy you're here. So I can thank you for that service. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you might say, if there's any, how did how was that received uh, where you are? How did people experience that service? Well, it's always a pleasure for Polynesian to bring love and our joy to other people and thank you for the opportunity to let me say that we or many Polynesian who, who loves to wake up early <laughs> because here it's very early and to join uh, through Facebook or YouTube your, your, your worship so thank you so much for your ministry John and Leon Fook. and um, it's, uh, I think it's a new way for us Polynesian to do worship online. It's very new. So sometimes we are not uh, perfectly uh, <laughs> dressed, or, <laughs> but it's always a pleasure for us. Well, Thank you. it was amazing for us, um, not only to hear all of these testimonies, very diverse testimonies yes. and inspiring, but also to experience this rich musical heritage. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way back, uh, you know, in so many generations in the church and, and it's so, so spirit-filled and rich. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you know here the community of Christ is uh, knows uh, as a small church, but uh, we are well known for our songs and choirs. I think it's our ministry to touch people through music and songs. Well, it definitely touched me, and I am so thank you for being <laughs> here with us to this day as well. Thank you. Neil, I want to thank you for being with us and for actually joining a lot of our teams and facilitating lots of our discussions and classes and things like that. Um, you have really been bringing a lot to the Beyond the Walls community. and. Um, one of the things that we're now doing in social hour as a result is uh, getting the opportunity to think about a lectionary text like this that we all kind of spoke to today uh, ahead of time. And so there was a great discussion group on Thursday that you facilitated that kind of was prefigured some of the thinking about this uh, uh, at that time.
Oh, Neil, your, your, your thing is, it's happened where your, your uh, computer's gone silent, even though you're not muted. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Um, uh, if you want, you can, you can close out and come back and we'll, we'll get that to work. <laughs> In the meantime, as long as we're talking about the, uh, the theme and the lectionary, Dan, I want to say thank you so much uh, for coming back to Beyond the Walls. Um, I'm a, sometimes I'm a little nervous when, um, when more than one minister decides they're going to uh, go down the lectionary path because then there might there's a potential for um, for duplication and yet I did that didn't happen. Everybody, uh, it's so wonderful when everybody is uh, able to bring their own uh, perspective and have that have that drawn out. And I absolutely love um, how you've anyway help you it made me experience the story that I love so much in a very different way. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, it's when I was listening to you, I was like, oh my goodness, that would have been a great point to include. And ooh, I love that additional <laughs> context. And that's the beauty of the conversation, right? Like you were talking about, scripture is in conversation together, and we are in conversation together. And you know, I think for me, one of the really challenging things was this was a hard text to preach on, right? There's there's so much going on in here. There's so much about justice and injustice and relationship. But I think that, you know, scripture often asks us to look for that which is on the underside, right? To, to go deeper, to say, don't just settle for the surface, but um, see what is the countercultural voice going on in here. And I think that was a, an opportunity that I was blessed with, but really challenged by um, this week in trying to prepare. Well, and I really appreciate um you taking our focus off when you're reading a story a lot of times you're the hero of the story and so we're of course everybody's Ruth um but right. by by when you even were telling the story I'm like I'm you know you, the the resonant way in which you were uh, retelling the story um made you immediately feel Naomi and where she's at and and it's harder I, th I mean it's not harder but it's hard for us often we have this idea of being ministers and we want to help uh, right. but then when we are in that place where we need help we, we a lot of times struggle to uh, be gracious receivers the way we have modeled being gracious givers. Yes, we, we think that that's, that that's for somebody else to do, right? That, that we just need to bottle up and figure out our own stuff and not let anybody else come close. And that's not the example that we've received. And, and, but it's really hard, right? It is hard. So many of us are trained to be the strong people in, in our lives. And, and sometimes we need to just say, you know what? My world is broken open and somebody, <laughs> anybody, come on, let's walk. And it even shows, I even love how you highlighted it, how gifted the, the um, uh, what a gifted author, whoever the anonymous author here of the text is, because even to understanding of the human nature, because Naomi, when she, when she just saw that Ruth was, was determined, she's like, she didn't say anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? In other words, it's not like, it's not like she says, oh, okay. But she just said, okay, whatever. I'm going to walk in. If you follow yeah. me, again, I'm not, not going to say, stop saying no or whatever. You know? <laughs> so. She just starts going. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's humor to be found. Absolutely. And so Neil, you're back. Let's see if we can get you unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, we were just talking about the idea that we get to experience these texts maybe more meaningfully if we put if we think about it ahead of time as disciples. And that lectionary room that you are leading gives us the perfect opportunity. I agree. And one thing that I've really noticed and have been reminded of is that scripture in its original context is to be read in community. And of course, nowadays, almost everyone has a copy of the Bible somewhere even in hotel rooms, they're, they're there. And that's become scripture being very devotional and personal. And like Dan has just said, often in our human nature, we wanna bottle things up. I think that's gone into our scriptural devotion as well. So these um, lectionary gatherings that we've been doing have brought so much insight that scripture is at its best when we're considering it in community because as I hear people give their reflections, I think, hmm, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> and we're coming to this from our own perspective, from our own context. And when we all share that, then it's so much more meaningful, weaved together in community, which is something I think our church does best. And I mean, I think that it's so amazing that then that, I think that, that all, even though we had very different um, 
takes and perspectives. Um, even when, like, when you're talking, your quotation uh, from Karl Barth about uh, a door and a closed door, then that was also something that Dan had in his sermon, and he also had uh, us all being connected, interconnected together, which is what Noel brought us together with at the beginning. And so many of these things inter and interweaved like that, um, up to and including um, uh, just even the connection between Bethlehem and then at the end again, you know, when we read the the finale to the story. So you know, when as the uh, the building the inclusive community that is not uh, uh, not closing the door against uh, the other. Um, that's what that's what it made the enriching whole that allowed for uh, anyway the end or the story is ongoing. But anyway, the bigger story. <laughs> so I'm going to ask. Um, I don't know, uh, Mary Jean, if we if we're needing to. We've just had the Mission Center conference, and I don't know if there's a lot of activities that anything we need to be highlighting or. Well, um, I just sent out a notice this week about a blog that our Apostle Art Smith has posted uh, regarding the position of uh, mission president. So this is a volunteer position. And uh, so he's just giving us some background about how that came about. So you can check that out on our webpage. Um, and we also have a a gene editing webinar coming up, which is presented by the Canadian Council of Churches. And that will be November the 3rd from four till 5.30 Eastern time. And also a, a climate change webinar that's coming up on November the 14th at five o'clock that continues the dialogue on you know, the things that we can do and this uh, particular webinar is about the changes that uh, uh, communities have been making to, uh, to make a difference in climate change. Those yeah, are all, so all very exciting topics. So the different, is there like a link for the last two activities? Or is that, are we getting that just in the Yeah, in the I'll put those in the, yeah, I'll put those in the chat. Okay. In the, uh, on the YouTube page for sure. Fantastic. Um, I don't know if you have anything you want to say. I just want to say thank you <laughs> for, for all your help. It's amazing to me uh, that, you know, we can have this service. We have ministers in the United States and Canada in Tahiti, and we have our tech support in the Netherlands. <laughs> and so it's amazing how Long things ways. can be so, so worldwide. Thank you, John. Andrew, uh, how have people uh, uh, been talking and responding and so on? Uh, the response, uh, well, if you if you talk about the um, the response to our our choir um, uh, call for help uh, with our, to support our music, just is great. I've been I've been getting the emails, letting me know about your generosity. Um, <clears throat> some of you have already. Um, uh, just in the last few minutes um, added um, to our fundraiser. So thank you so much. I wanna thank once again, the choir. As always, you guys get better and better every week, make my job easier. So that's why we're gonna go for more. Um, <laughs> I invite everyone. So you don't have to, you don't have to be a singer a um, professional singer or a trained singer to sing with the Beyond the Walls Choir, but you will get better if you sing with us <laughs> every week. And um, this, I want to invite everyone because now we're recording once again the Spirit of God, this time in English only. We've already done the Tahitian and all the other languages. <laughs> this time we're doing just English. So. I invite everyone to add your voice to, to this very special hymn and also to add your voice to Handel's Hallelujah. Uh, so that's, that's going to be very challenging. So we're rehearsing the Hallelujah uh, now every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. So even those of you in Tahiti, you can join us because it's not so early. <laughs> okay, so that's all for today. So thanks, everyone. It's been wonderful. All right. Well, thank you all so much. It was an amazing service. Thank you for your ministry. Thanks, everyone, for being with us today. And we'll say goodbye.